My guest today is Mikael Mala. Mikael is a rising star in the Nasheed world. He's also a world-renowned Qur'an reciter and teacher. He resides in the heart of England's thriving Muslim population, Birmingham. Before you continue and listen to this interview, it would really mean a lot to me if you subscribe to my channel and like this video. It will help my work out a lot. Also, don't forget to check out the episode notes, which you can find on the website, makingsenseofislam.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find all the links, especially to Mika Il's YouTube uh, channel, uh, which you should also subscribe to. And you can follow all of the links and all of the things that we mention. I do want to say something in the outset, uh, well, two points, which is one, this was a retake because I had problems in the summer with my audio for some reason when I recorded it. And when I did this take, I was recording in Cairo, Egypt, and the concrete walls were not cooperating with my mic, so my voice is a little cave-like in the video. I do apologize for that in advance. You'd think 100, almost 100 episodes into the podcast, I'd have figure out sound, uh, but it's always a little tricky and, and finicky, and I do apologize if my sound is a little bit, you know, like sounds like I'm in the middle of a cave. Uh, I will address that, inshallah, moving forward into other episodes. Anyway, I don't want to ramble. I want to leave you with this beautiful episode. Without further ado, please enjoy this conversation and the beautiful voice of none other than Mikael Mala. Mikael, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me today. So our listeners and our viewers won't know this, but this is the second time we do this. You were gracious enough to uh, be interviewed over the summer, and it was actually a tremendous uh, interview, but then there was something wrong with the audio quality when I came, came to check it a few, a few weeks after that, and I had to scrap it, and then we've been chasing each other schedule-wise, so uh, I'm sorry that, you know, you have to do this. For everyone, this is going to be the first time they hear you, but for me and you, this is almost like we're trying to re reconstruct what we've done. Yeah, but thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. Anyway, uh, if you do it a hundred times, I don't know. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, that's just because you're so, you're so generous. Okay, so now that I've gotten to know you more, and I actually did listen to the first uh, to the first one. I was debating whether I I was trying to see if there was something I could do with one of the audio tracks, but it just it didn't work out. So there are some things that I want to repeat, but and I'll save I'll save my nuanced questions for a little later. But I think the way I began last time, the way I want to begin this time is just you know really at the beginning. Uh, and I want to know, and I want to learn, and I want to hear from you. What were, the, you know, how did you get started in in this nasheed business? Uh, and you know, what were your early influences and your early upbringing and those those factors that sort of helped lead you to where you are today? Uh, so when I first started, uh, when I first started to sing nasheed, it was actually when I was when I was twelve years old. Uh, or 11, I think 11 years old actually, when I first started to sing and first started to publicly sing the sheets. However, I've always been singing before that. So since the age of three or four years old, I've been singing, uh, I've been having performances, singing on stage. But uh, be prior to 11, 12 years old, I was just singing uh, normal classical, traditional English songs like Frank Sinatra, the very old Michael Jackson, Jackson 5 type of music and Cat Stevens, these uh, type of people. So I was singing these type of songs when I was very young. Um, that partially, or that partly due to my, the influence of my parents, they used to play uh, these people in the car consistently, as well as uh, many Arab singers as well, but they were the singers that I could understand and could relate to at the time. So with the Nasheeds, it came actually because of a Nasheed competition. I saw uh, an advert on, uh, on, the t on the television one day, and the advert was, the prize was an Umrah ticket. At that point, I didn't know a single Nasheed off by heart, I didn't know a single Nasheed as well. Maybe Dara Abu Alina, but that was that's about, that's about it. That's all I knew. Then um, I thought, okay, maybe I could enter this competition, maybe win that Umrah ticket. So I thought I'd get a song that I already knew, which was uh, Hallelujah by Leonard uh, Cohen. So I, I got that song and uh, I looked and I searched online for a Islamic, quote unquote, Islamic version or Arabic version, you could say. I found one and I ended up performing that at this competition, which I won. There at the competition, it was the first time singing the Shi'is, first time performing to a uh, majority Muslim audience. It was a different feeling. I enjoyed it because I always had this passion for uh, Islam and Quran and listening to the Quran from when I was very young. So that was the first time being involved in uh, such 
well, being around such an audience or such a such group of people, groups of people. From there, people started inviting me to more and more events. So I had one event, two events, three events, four events. But at each event, I couldn't sing the same song, Ya Ilahi. I'd have to learn, learn uh, slowly, slowly more and more nasheed and qasaid. And then from there, the rest is history. Alhamdulillah, now probably in the hundreds of nasheed and qasaid. So that first competition, you said you won that competition? Yeah, yeah. MashaAllah. And did you end up going to Umrah? Yeah. Uh, so actually, I went to Umrah two years, or no, I think a year later after winning that competition. And... It was really that trip, that Umrah trip, which wasn't simply just Umrah. It was also Egypt. So I went to Egypt first and then I went to Umrah after. So that was my first ever trip to Egypt as well. So going to Egypt first opened a different door and a different dimension uh, to Islam for me that I had never seen before. What year was this? This is 2012, 2012. So just after. Mm -hmm. And that was your first time ever uh, going to Umrah? Yeah, first time ever in Umrah, for Umrah and first time for uh, yeah. Egypt or any other country you could see. Wow, wow. Mashallah. I remember uh, recently I was talking to somebody uh, about the, you know, the first time they saw the Kaaba. I, I don't know who it was. It was Peter Sanders. Uh, Peter Sanders, who by the time people hear our conversation, inshallah, or that podcast actually is public. So sorry, I just published it. So people will have heard of it. But he was talking about the first time he saw the Kaaba. So I was reminiscing. Uh, the first time I remember I was a young boy and I remember the first time I saw it, it's hard to put in words, but that's a very, that's one of those things that will stay with you, you know, for the rest of your life. So I can imagine, you know, not only did you get to go, but you got it because you won, you know, showing off your talent. So I can imagine how that's, you know, pretty special. Yeah. So seeing the Kaaba that first time was, yeah, something unique and indescribable. So you'd only know that until you go there, until you go there. So my teacher that I went with at the time, he told me, just keep your gaze down and until you, we're right in front of the Kaaba, then look up and see it. And then make the yeah, du'as. So, Alhamdulillah, today those du'as, I think, I feel that Alhamdulillah, when it to this day. Alhamdulillah. I mean, one, one can write a book just on, you know, the du'as made in Mecca that have been answered. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opening, you know, for so many of us. So there's a lot in that I want to get to, but I want to go back to something very specific that you said, Frank Sinatra. So uh, do you have a favorite Frank Sinatra song? Uh, at the time? Uh, autumn leaves, autumn leaves like Frank Sinatra. I used to sing that everywhere and uh, at all the events I used to go to. Okay, and uh, Jackson Five is your favorite tune? Jackson Five, I think I'll be there. I'll be there was my favorite. Ah, okay, okay. Either I'll be there or Ben uh, between between okay. either one of the. Uh, yeah, I, I remember when uh, Mariah Carey sang that at uh, Michael Jackson's funeral. Uh, so yeah, you know it's it's a beautiful song and and it and it, and it has a lot of uh, potential. I think there are you know many different performers have performed it in slightly different ways, a lot of highs, a lot of lows. So yeah, it's a okay, interesting. So your parents are your parents musically inclined, or or this was just sort of naturally this is sort of what they like to do to just have like music playing in the background. It was just their passion for music. So my father he used to um, and even to this day he still listens to and collects you know old uh, records, so vinyl records. Okay. So it's a the singers, so Nina Simone, um, that, that I can remember off the top of my head, uh, Sam Cook, these singers, so he used to play these uh, singers and get their vinyls and play them at home and CDs in the car. You get the best sound system in the car just to listen to that music from back in the days. And my mother as well, she used to listen to a lot of music in the 70s. So she was really my mother that influenced me and that pushed me more to sing. Uh, my father, I took an influence from the style of music that he listened to, but my mother, she pushed me to listen to. You, you were born and raised in the UK? Uh, yeah, yeah. And are both your parents immigrants to the UK? Uh, no, both of them were born in the UK as well. So my father in 1962. Oh, wow. 19... I did not realize. Long yeah, long time ago. And then where is your family? Where did they immigrate from? Uh, so my grandfather from my father's side, so my father's side, they originally they're Indian, but they moved to Africa, to Mozambique, uh, East Africa. They stayed there for so many years and then from there they came to England and my mother her aside her family came from uh, Pakistan. Okay mashallah I did not I did not realize that. So it, it sounds like the early influences were more American the music wise of it more yeah, than the music American was I don't remember listening to the British singer Deborah Cat Stevens uh, yeah. so yeah, that was probably it. Okay cool cool so you see this the sheet thing you get involved and then you start learning now uh, you know the world. You know the world of nasheeds. Uh, it's a it's it's a little bit actually 
believe it or not, for me, a, mis a mystery. I, I don't really quite understand that world because uh, there's a lot of different trends and you know a lot of different movements. And so, can you give me like five to ten minute like tutorial of 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 the world as it is now? I mean, it's very. I mean, I would say like the last ten years, it's it's really flourishing. It's really booming, you know, mashallah, which I think is a good thing. It's a good thing. But it is a little bit confusing uh, because I think the sheets, as I understand them, are, you know, very classical poems that are to be sung in a very classical way. And now there's a lot of nuance. So how, how would you, if you were explaining the sheets to somebody who doesn't know anything about them, you know, in just like a few minutes, what would you say? So... With the nasheeds, when people, whenever people ask me, oh, did you, was that latest release that you did, was that a nasheed or was that a song or whatever like that? I, in my definition or in my interpretation of nasheeds, anything that is uh, good, praising Allah or praising his Prophet وسلم, or even just praising the ni'mah, so the blessings of Allah that we have in our life, or uh, like talking about things, talking about life, then for me that's nasheed with a good uh, meaning. And in terms of the industry at the moment, it, you're right, it's evolved a lot in the last uh, 10 years. So we first started off with, uh, I think, with Sami Yusuf, Zain Bika, Daud Wonsby, these people back in the early 2000s. I remember listening to them. And from there, it developed, developed. So it started off voice only, then percussion, then the whole debate about whether percussion was allowed or not allowed. Then music came about. This is in the West anyway, in the Arab world, it's a different uh, story. But... It developed, 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 and now we have the likes of uh, Maher Zain, Sami Yusuf, and even people that are innovating more than uh, these people in, in the field of uh, Nasheed. So they're having different styles, they're adopting different styles from the West or from whatever country they're, they're from, and they're bringing that style uh, forward to the audience that they are uh, catering to. Yeah, in your course, uh, uh, in the last, you know, well, I guess ever since that competition, uh, did you ever have any formal instruction into like the qasaid and maqamat and these type of things? So with qasaid, uh, not specifically, no. Uh, qasaid, it was just my own thing. With Quran, maqamat, yes, but that was from the Quranic uh, side of things. So I did learn maqamat for, of, of the voice from a Quran teacher. So for my resolution of the Quran. Yeah. MashaAllah. And I know, of course, for people that don't know, that there, there's always been an overlap with that. As a matter of fact, the old Quran teachers at Al-Azhar, they used to learn the Oud so that they could learn the sound of the different maqams. Uh, so you know, the recitation of the Quran will hopefully will, will get you to do some you know, demo in a little bit. But that, that's, it's, it's an art form, obviously. And to, to match the meaning of the verse with its right maqam, whether it's a happy maqam or a sad maqam, the place is talking about. I mean, it's really an art form. Uh, so not only do you have to memorize or keep the tension of the verse that you're reciting, or the surah you're reciting, you also have to start thinking about what is it meaning and how does it sound like things like that. Um, okay, so Egypt. Uh, I know for me that Egypt is a big part uh, of your life. And uh, we recently met in Egypt, actually, alhamdulillah. So uh, tell me about what role Egypt has played for you sort of in your journey since that competition? So after that competition, I was always into um, Quran, listening to Quran, especially Sheikh uh, Abdul Basak al Samad and uh, Sheikh Mustafa Ismail al Shawi. The likes of these, so in my head, before I even went to Egypt, I, I had this image of Egypt as a, as a place of Quran, recitals of Quran. Like I'd go anywhere, I'd, I'd feel like that, at that time I did think that when I'd walk around in Egypt, I'd hear Quran everywhere, which is, it's not, uh, it's not a lie, you do hear the Quran everywhere. But I thought every second person would be a qari as well. In, in my head, that's what I thought. So actually, I went to Egypt, as I said, just before the Umrah. Um, from Egypt, we went to, uh, to Saudi. So we went to Egypt myself and my teacher. So my uh, Quran teacher from UK, who also studied in Egypt. Uh, so he introduced me to teachers there. He introduced me to the sites, the historical sites, the maqams, the, you know, all, everything, the culture, of the full history of Egypt. In, well, Cairo, at least, anyway. So it was from there that I had a full, I fell in love with Egypt. Maybe, probably because I drank uh, tap water. I don't know if that, <laughs> that was the case, but because I did that, maybe that's why I started to go back to Egypt, as that's what they say is a sif. For, yeah, Egypt. So for people that are listening, it's, it's, a, it's a common uh, expression in Egypt that if you drink from the Nile River, you're always meant to come back. So if he had tap water, as I did when I was a kid, you know, you're always going to, and I found it to be true. So I found that to be true. 
So from there, it just slowly, slowly. So at that time, even when I came back from, to England from the trip of Umrah in Egypt, I had this passion in my heart to go back to Egypt. Of course, we all miss uh, Umrah, we miss the Kaaba, we miss Medina, but I had a real strong passion to go back to Egypt to study uh, the religion. After I saw the environment there, I saw the, the shiuch there, I saw everything there, it just made me fall in love with it. And I did uh, continuously go back to Egypt at least uh, twice a year for three, four months at a time. Too. So I did uh, studies with the Quran, uh, Tajweed, Maqamat, and Fiqh, whilst I was um, visiting Egypt. Okay. You, do you also, uh, are you also that close to other parts of the Muslim world, or is really Egypt like a unique thing for you? For me, it's, yeah, of course, Egypt is my number one uh, place, um, since, because it, it feels like I was raised in Egypt because I've been going since I was 12 years old and now I'm 22. So for the last 10 years, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards from Egypt. Mm-hmm. But as well, I feel uh, a close connection with uh, Algeria, Morocco, these countries. Algeria, because my sheikh, my teacher um, in Fit from uh, who was residing in Egypt, he's from Algeria. So the first time I went to Algeria, I went with him for over six, seven weeks. So I went to the Sahara, to the, um, the desert in Algeria and studied there with his teachers. Who's, and then the next time... Uh, Sheikh Zuhair, Sheikh Zuhair Kuzan. Oh, Sheikh Zuhair, mashallah. I didn't know that you're, med- you're medical. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, mashallah, I didn't know that. Okay, interesting. So uh, Sheikh Zuhair, um, he introduced me to Algeria. Well, I knew about Algeria before from singers, Sheikh Khalid and Rai music and stuff like that. But Sheikh Zuhair showed me the real Algeria, the scholars, the ulama. And it's something, it's a place that not many people would um, associate with the scholars or ulama and stuff like that. People don't really have this image of Algeria like that. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, he's from a hardcore, I mean, for people that don't know, he's like in the desert, desert, you know, uh, and I know some people who study with him in Cairo, and it's, it's very intense. Uh, I studied in, you know, Azhar, and it's, it's, it's ancient and modern, it's like Hogwarts, that's what I always say. Yeah. But, but Sheikh Zuhair, you know, mashallah, he's in that authentic, you know, desert tradition. I mean, even in Egypt, uh, his students and where how he teaches. Yeah, he himself continuing that. Yeah. He's still continuing that. On. So I remember sitting with when I first went to meet him. It was actually uh, next to Sayyidina Hussein Mosque. Yeah. I was 18 years old then. He was teaching uh, one of the flats in one of the apartments above. So I went to see him. I was wearing the Emma. I was wearing the Jalabiya and everything. He thought I was from Mauritania when I first met him. Then I told him I'm from England and stuff. So I'd like to uh, accompany you study. At that time, my Arabic was very, very broken. I couldn't speak it. Hardly could speak it. Okay. But then he took me, he said, uh, come to my house. So I went with him to his house, which is behind uh, Azhar, I sat with him. So I was his first uh, Western or British student at that time. And then from there, alhamdulillah, many came from there. So you're, so this is, I'm glad, you know, this is a, a, interesting because this did not come up in our first conversation. But um, I did not realize that you also were doing traditional studies. Is yeah. that because you felt or you feel like just like a personal interest or it's sort of that's really what, where you want to go in the future or what was the drive for that? So initially uh, just going to Egypt in the first place I was in my head I was planning to go to study in Egypt for about seven ten years to do the full Azhar College University maybe master's and then doctorate in Azhar that changed when uh, I got married so I had to come back to England but uh, that was my intention for Egypt first. And initially, it was just Quran. I thought I'd focus in the field, of, focus on the field of Quran, so Tashweed, Maqama, Tira, stuff like that. Um, I always had this in, uh, interest with Fiqh and jurisprudence and Maliki Fiqh and stuff. Because from my teachers in Egypt, a lot of them were Maliki as well. Uh, prior to Sheikh Zahir, prior to meeting Sheikh Zahir, um, when I came to found of his um, classes, I came to know about his classes in Egypt. I attended a few of them, sat at the back, listened took notes I couldn't understand. That really made me um, passionate, more eager, more eager. And from there, just keeping his company made me, gave me that, um, I'd say that passion for Fiqh. And I did want to study it as well, even though I didn't want to become, say, um, uh, a faqih or, or an, a sheikh that would give uh, quick, uh, talks or crunch question answers, stuff like this, or or I don't know, a mufti or anything like that. It was just a personal passion within myself. I thought I'm studying the Quran, so let me study fiqh with it at the same time. Let me uh, have more knowledge on the religion as well. I mean, so I would say, you know, off the bat, that, that's a big difference uh, I see in you with other, with other nasheed, you know, artists or, or artists in general. Um, I think that, well, that it's rare, I think, but 
I also think it makes more sense. In other words, I think that studying the traditional Islamic sciences, uh, even at a, at a beginning level, so you're really being trained in the arts, a different type of art. But to master these subjects, it's really the only way you can think of it is, 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 is to reach the level of, of mastery and, and to be an artist. Uh, so I'm glad that you did that uh, because I think what you're doing, it, it comes out as an expression of Islamic civilization and Islam, Islamic thought. Uh, I don't see it as like, you know, sort of parallel to or different from, it's just an expression of it. So I'm glad that, you know, you are taking it upon yourself to, you know, to be grounded in the, the basics as well. That's, that's really good, mashallah. I'm, I'm glad to, to know that. And is that something that you've continued? Um, yes, yeah, so every time I do go back to Egypt, so even this last time, uh, last month, I go back to Sahara, sit with him, study with him. And even going back to study Quran there, so the field of Qira'a never ends, even though I'm a Quran teacher now and I teach Quran on the side, uh, the field of studying never ends. And you know, you'd know that yourself, this, the amount of teachers, the amount of ulama, the amount of books, the amount of lessons that you can learn just from watching a scholar, it's, um, it's never ending. So definitely. But uh, inshallah, I do hope in the future to go back for a longer period of time to study more. Inshallah, inshallah. Egypt's always open, you know that, alhamdulillah. Uh, your, your path, you know, into, into this, uh, how did that impact your family? And as they saw that this became more serious and, and you know, now it's essentially your life, how was how the impact on your family and your close friends? How's that been? So with my family, they're not actually uh, a practicing, I don't come from a practicing background. So with them, initially, it was something strange. It was something uh, completely, uh, was di I completely diverted away from the trend or what they wanted me to do. Um, initially, they had their worries. They had their worries, why am I going to Egypt? Because they have, to this day, they've never been to Egypt as well. <laughs> so um, they always had these worries, why am I going to Egypt? Who am I studying with? Who am I with? So it took a long time to build the trust of my parents with my teachers from England first to take me to Egypt and then well, the trust of my parents for me for them to allow me to go alone and study in Egypt. And from there to this day, um, they respect what I'm doing. They're happy with what I'm doing. They ask me questions here and there um, just about the religion or they think that I'd know uh, X, Y, and Z answer or they'd find, ask me to find, ask, ask a sheikh for an answer about this. You could say so. Yeah. <laughs> you could say the family. That happens to all of us. Yeah. Good. So, so they're okay with everything. Yeah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Very supportive. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So I know that in England, you know, there's a huge uh, Muslim population and there's, a, you know, statistically much more than in the States. I mean, like with the percent of the population. Wise. And then uh, there's a lot of Muslim activities, events, functions. Uh, it, my understanding is that, you, you know, you're like a mainstay. You're, you're, you're all over the country, like, you know, going from here and there and performing. Is that, is that accurate? I mean, before COVID, yeah, before COVID, definitely. I don't know about if I can say it on the camera during COVID, but before COVID, definitely, I used to um, go at least once a week, at least uh, twice, three times a week. I'd be in different cities other than my own city. I'm performing in my own city. That's guaranteed at least weekly, uh, especially the months of Rabi, Ramadan. Maybe in one day, we'd go to four or five cities just for events, reciting, uh, singing, different things. So as a child, it was really... Um, it took a lot out of me, so I did take a lot. I spend a lot of time away from school for my studies, <laughs> because I'd go to events. So I'd leave early from class to go to events and come back late. But uh, that's just the life <laughs> that I've still got as a child till now. Did you continue your studies or, or complete them? Yeah, yeah. So I completed my studies uh, there, but I didn't get to go to university yet, so because I went to Egypt and that was my intention to study in Egypt. But maybe, shall learn the next year or two. Okay. Okay. So England is a, maybe a little bit like the States in, in that, you know, it's normal. There is a space for delaying things and, you know, going back to school. What you just said would make anybody in the Middle East, you know, their, like, hair fall off. That, they can't compute that. There's no, there's no going to college later. It's, you have to go. You have to go at that time. And that's so, it. Um, I mean, that, that's good that you, obviously, the, the life that you're, you're, you're living, it would not be, it would be very hard to do that in other places. Um, but as, as your older brother, I would encourage you to complete your studies. I, I wouldn't be doing my duty if I didn't say it. You know? <laughs> You're not that much older than my oldest son. So I think, you know, it's important. Um, you teach Quran, right? Yeah. 
So I teach to schedule something with you, like I'm teaching and I see like on, on social media, you have Quran activity. So what's that like? It's quite intense, especially um, since COVID happened, I'm teaching online now, um, back to back. So say in 45 minutes, I've got my next class, for example. Ah. From 4 p.m. UK time until 10 p.m. Every single day, I'm, oh, the weekdays, I'm teaching. That's just my life. Well, are, you, are you teaching Tajweed? Uh, tajweed, Maqamat, um, the books of Tajweed, so uh, Jazariya, Tahfut al Atfal. And you know, basic teaching uh, children how to read Arabic, and even for them to read the Quran. So people can understand because this is something that you have to hear uh, using a couple verses of Quran. If you're if you're comfortable with it, can you give uh, viewers, listeners, a sense of what the maqams are and how they're different? Like, if can you recite maybe one verse with a couple of different maqams so people can understand what that even means? Because I think that a lot of people listening and watching probably don't even know what that means. Yeah, sure, inshallah. So the maqams are Arabic um, melodical tunes or Arabic uh, musical tunes, musical notes. Um, so in English, I, I, I never really studied English music, but uh, I do know there are certain uh, scales. So the maqams are also certain Arabic uh, scales. So for something, so let's say I'm telling a story, I recite maqam hijaz. So maqam hijaz is very famous for the adhan. Um, say in Surah Yusuf. إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين مقام حجاز it's a perfect, uh, perfect story uh, surah to recite مقام حجاز with why because it's a story about uh, Sayyidina Yusuf the Prophet Yusuf then if I want uh, something more let's say something more Mellow, something more sad. I'd recite Maqam Nahawan, which at times you can use for a happy, uh, happy place in the Quran, or at times for sad places in the Quran. إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين that's uh, Maqam Nahman, for example. So it's a common misconception where people think that you have to study Maqamat with uh, the Quran. Or to become a Qari, you have to know the Maqams. No, because the famous reciters like Sheikh Abu Basit, Sheikh Mustafa Ismail, these reciters, they actually never studied Maqamat initially anyway. The, I think Sheikh Mustafa Ismail, he said that he learned the Maqams just from the audience. Uh, when he used to recite this, say, oh, mashallah, uh, Nahawan or Hijaz or Rast or whatever mm-hmm. Maqam that was. So he learned that was that Maqam. So Sheikh Abu Basit as well, he developed his own style. Of course, uh, studying them is important later on. But develop your own style, I think, first from your own self, from your own nafs, from your own heart, from your own ihsas, and, and portray that forward with the meaning of the Qur'an. That you can... Uh, and you can well, develop. I mean, it's, it's audible. It, it, so it's, it's, you can... It, it, people do study it. But the difference between somebody who studied it and somebody who could do it is like the difference between you and me. I could never do what you just did. <laughs> it's my life dependent on it. I mean, but I could articulate and get all academic about like, you know, the maqam and, you know, the measure and the elongation and this and that. So at the end of the day, if you're a performer, if you're an artist, if you're a reciter of the Quran, you like you said, it's got to come from the heart or else it's not going to. Uh, so that that's Michelle. Okay, I, we need a couple more, man, because th- this is for me, this is one of the most fascinating things. Inshallah. <clears throat> If you, it would even be better if you could do the same verse from Surah Yusuf, like just with like one more maqam, just so people can hear how the same verse can be, you know, enunciated so so differently. This one, inshallah. So maqam ajam now. إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر 
Well, I, I kind of wish we started with the songs. I hate to like leave the Quran and go to music, but I mean, <laughs> that's sort of this is the flow of the of the conversation. Um, well, thank you for for doing that. I, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm just personally very fascinated by the maqams and and uh, you know how beautiful they can they can make the Quran even more. And and like to emphasize what you said, it's not like a necessary part of reciting the Quran. You know, standing in front of a of a jama'ah and leading prayer is, is one of the most difficult things, even if it's just a simple prayer, because you have to remember everything and you have to do everything out loud. And the person behind you, they're just sort of parked, you know, they're just enjoying it. Uh, so they say, uh, So the person who recites the Quran, they're milking. You know, they're bringing out this energy, they're bringing out these sounds, they're bringing out these verses. But the person listening, they're the ones that are going to drink that in. If you're reciting, it's very hard for you to drink it. But Al-Quran Ghalib, the Quran is over both. So you see the greatest imams, they make mistakes uh, because yes. it's just so overwhelming, you know, being in the, in the mimbar. Uh, I, people don't realize that. Uh, so if you add on to that, okay, you need to do these five verses in Nahawan, then you have to do these five verses in Rasul, it becomes... I can imagine it's become more, more complicated. Um, so shifting for, to the music, uh, one of the things that I appreciate about what you're doing, and I'm a, you know, for people that don't know, of course, I'm a big supporter of, of your work. And, uh, you know, if there's, even if this is something small that I can do to promote what you're doing, I, I want to do that. One of the things I appreciate about what you're doing is I find you to be innovative in the in the space of nasheed. So I'm not criticizing people that, that sing classical nasheeds. You know, those are the nasheeds that I sing or I know. And if we had like a little gathering, you know, those are the tunes that I know. There's nothing wrong with that. That's beautiful. But what I appreciate about what you're doing, why I think this is really important, and I'm, you know, inshallah, praying for your you know, ultimate success in the future, is that you are, you know, there's ibda, there's this creative process that I see with you that you are trying to, you know, write new lyrics, new tunes that sort of blend the modern. Uh, sometimes you have a song, it doesn't sound overtly Islamic or religious, but, you know, it talks about a certain theme that, you know, obviously we would say is an important, you know, ethical theme and things like that. So I want to I want to just to dig in a little bit. I know that I I am cognizant of your time. So when you when you gotta go, you just give me like a five minute warning. But I would like to know about your thought process. I'm very very interested in that creative process. As I said, I see that very similar to an island, you know, issuing a fatwa or an island writing a book or an author writing a, a, no, a novelist writing a novel. It's it's that it's a creative process. I, I'd like to learn more about your creative process. Where do you find inspiration? How do you compose this music? So with me, uh, I actually listen to a wide uh, range of music myself. So it doesn't matter which country it's from, whether it's from Algeria, from to Spain, to Brazil, or to America, or to, U to the UK. It doesn't matter which genre it is as well. I would listen to different types of music and take different things from the things that I like and the things that are nice from different uh, types of music and then bring it and try and blend it into one style. So say, for example, in the UK, something's really uh, doing well here, like a certain certain melody, a certain type of melody, a certain type of style is doing well here. Even though maybe I can't rap, for example, if rap is doing really well here, uh, I can't rap myself, but I'll try and get, for example, the type of instruments or a certain type of thing from that and bring it into my own music to make it more relatable for my listeners or for the people that listen to uh, the nishis that I produce or the, the content that I produce. So even with the lyrics, it starts off with making a theme. So first I, I think of which theme, just as you would... Uh, do the same for thinking of a speech or a khutbah. You think of the theme of the khutbah. What does my community really need right now? What do I need to convey to my community? The same thing with my uh, nasheeds and my songs. I think of a theme first and think of something which uh, people would enjoy, but also would relate to people and resonate with people because that's the best way to build a connection with people is to really resonate with them. So if I was just to speak about um, this pink uh, cup that I've got right here, and to speak, uh, speak about this just because I like a pink cup or sing about this because I like this pink cup. Nobody's going to really, maybe people might listen to the first song that I do about it, but afterwards, nobody will really relate to it. Nobody will 
feel anything from that. But if I speak about my journey in life, if I speak about common tra- challenges and trials that people have in life, that will make more people resonate with my music. And you can see that in the, in the, the mainstream music as well. People talk about their own issues in life and it resonates with people, even though they might be um, bad or so bad, bad problems. So for example, somebody might be talking about their drug addiction, for example. And they talk about that they keep on taking drugs or somebody might talk, be talking about gambling and they keep on gambling away their money. But certain people will, re- will resonate with that. And you need to find a point um, that is ethical, a, a, a topic that's ethical, a theme that's ethical, a theme that's uh, universally uh, accepted as well with people. Say in uh, Algeria, maybe doing a certain thing isn't right or in Egypt doing a certain thing isn't right, but in the UK it is. So I'm trying to find the balance between every country and every place, a common theme that everybody has, we as humans that we have, say, we all feel pain when um, a pet dies, for example. I don't sing about pets dying, but that's something that I could think of the top of my head. So if somebody, everybody has this pain when they when their pet dies, or if a family member dies, everybody has this theme, theme when a family member dies, has this feeling of pain and hurt when a family member dies. So I'll try to sing about that and portray that and um, bring an Islamic message, message as well into that nasheed, even though it might not be you know, outwardly there that Allah has, um, this is Allah as well, this is his decree. But I might uh, bring it in subtly so people can uh, so enjoy this. So the song, the, the one that you filmed when you were in Egypt, what's the title of it, by the way? Yeah, uh, Allah Ya Mawlana. Allah Ya Mawlana. So how long did it take you to, to put the words and the tune together from the moment you got the idea? Just so so the tune is actually a really famous, uh, sorry, the song itself is a really famous um, song from Nassau Liwan in Morocco. It's a mainstream, uh, they were a mainstream folk group that were in Morocco in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. Oh, you know, okay. Uh, so the, these were their words. I, t- I took these words and I thought, how can I make, so I'll send you the link after, after the show as well, um, after the interview as well, and you can see how it changed from that to what I released with as well. So I thought, let me take these words that I like them and make them into something modern, make them into something uh, for people to listen to. Mm. Um, so I sat, literally how it happened, I was, it was Ramadan last year. So May, maybe May or April last year, 2020, during the lockdown, I was in my car. I bought literally a Darbuka beat on YouTube and I thought, let me sing over it. So this came to my head, I'll sing Allah Um I recorded a short clip of that. I sent that clip to... A friend who is also a singer, and that friend said to me, yeah, you, should, "You should release this, this, and that." I said, "I don't know anybody that can produce it." He says, "Yeah, we've got a friend that's a producer. He could do something." So he he sent that clip to the producer, and the producer made music on that clip of me singing on the Durbuka in the car. He sent it back to me. I really loved it. So the next day, we said, "Let's meet. Let's record it." So we actually recorded the song within the space of twenty hours, twenty-two hours. So okay. from the idea to the actual recording and the finished recording was 22 hours. But then it was like eight, nine months until I could do a video, which I just did in Egypt. No, in Shere, okay. and old I always enjoy when you send me like, you know, little clips of like what's in the works. I feel like it's, I, I'm like one of these, ex- I get this exclusive look <laughs> into what you're doing. And yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the creative process. Uh, I know that everyone's different. There's no, you can't codify it. There's no rhyme or reason. But I'm, I'm a little surprised that you said 22 hours. I thought, I thought you were going to say like maybe like a couple of weeks or something. But I guess... The recording itself is for like three hours maybe. That's it. Three hours. <laughs> so, when you get inspired, you just sort of, you know, it just, mm-hmm. it just comes out. Yeah, so that, with Allah, Himalaya, that was something, that was probably the quickest I've ever, ever recorded a track. From the get-go and i didn't even know the words i was reading them off my uh, phone as well at that time because <laughs> i didn't even have time to prepare anything i just literally we went there and recorded it but maybe the blessings of ramadan i don't know <laughs> the, the era of ramadan that made me well do. i mean all of your your songs i'm, I'm going to make sure that they're in the episode notes uh, for people to, to uh, access I mean, your youtube channel uh so i don't want to take up the time and have you you know sing something that's already there but do you have I don't want you to share something that you're working on, but you, do you have something that you've kind of finished, but but you haven't necessarily published that you can share with us, like or like tunes that you're you know you're you're considering? Um, I don't want to spoil your 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 process, so don't share with us anything that's like still like under construction. At the moment, there's two things that are like I'm thinking about uh, recording, but I haven't really had uh, got to. Uh, well, one of them is actually fully finished and fully recorded. 
but I don't want to uh, release that yet until it comes yeah, yeah. Um Another one I was thinking about um, literally making a new full new tune. So I sent a um, just like a simple beat to a mulahin, a person that makes melodies and tunes in Egypt to make the tune for it. So literally I'm working on that with him uh, with him right now on that. So I'll tell him do this and let's change this, let's do this, let's do that. But at the moment, there's nothing off the top of my head that I've actually done yet. No, so, I will, I will, we will wait and, uh, and get it from you raw. Um, what, what currently, or change my train of thought, from the classical stuff, uh, do you perform classical stuff? Yeah, so most of my performances, so if I get invited to a message, I'll perform the classical stuff because uh, all the gatherings, like you said, I perform all the classical stuff. Ah. But just depending on where I am. Or okay, so I'm... they're not inviting you to hear your new stuff. They want to hear. No, no. They want to hear oh, Cameroon. Oh, they want to hear oh, Borda. They want to hear uh, <laughs> all these things. So. Okay, okay. So can you give us a sample of like, you know, okay, we invited you to our message fundraiser and, you know, this is the entertainment part and like you're on. Like, what would you, what would you uh, say? I, other than yes. the Quran, what would you start with? Then I'll start with the Salawat first or Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad. So I'll do something like Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so something like that, and then build it up, build it up, maybe do something um Kamarun. Well, that would be my last song that yeah, I do. Yeah, that's like that. everyone knows for. So I'd do that. Um and maybe that's just like make you just make some icon and you leave and everyone's like, no, we want more, and then you come back and you're like, Kamarun. <laughs> so it'll always be Kamarun. That's I have to, I can't and I can never sing without I can never go to an event without Kamarun. That's, that's like a you know, a very special thing in Egypt. Uh, I mean, whenever there's a maulid or something, and then, you know, the, the munches always end with khamaran. And, you know, the women, they do the zagruta, and it's, you know, it's like festive, and it's, it's, a, it's mashallah. I mean, I think any praise of the Prophet, awesome, of course, is special, but there's something about that one specifically. Uh, so you got me thinking, do you, do you, uh, this might be a little bit too personal, but I mean, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But do you do the nasheeds of like the, the hadra and like the, the, the gatherings of dhikr? Do you also do the sheets there or that's not your thing? Uh, yeah, I do. So it um, depends on who invites me. So in Egypt, I'd uh, go on to the hadra uh, Ja'fariya and I'd perform the uh, recite the qasaid of Sheikh Saleh. MashaAllah. Or uh, for hey, example, Why did you tell me? <laughs> I would love to. Did you go last time you were here? The last time, no, because everything's close. So. Ah, okay, okay. Let, next time you go, you gotta tell them, and that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Every Thursday, I mean, Sunday. Sunday. Habit, you know, we're not used to attending other uh, turuks, dhikr. Uh, you know, just kind of like as a custom, not like it's a haram halal thing, mm -hmm. but, you know, but in, in that case, I would definitely go. So what, what's that like? So that's literally a mosque, uh, the masjids are obviously they have Sheikh Saleh, and then for two, three hours, the Maddaheen, the, the reciters and the Shis, they're reciting all from the poetry. Diwan of Sheikh Saleh, who's got 12 Diwan, 12, uh, yeah, 12 volumes of poetry. So you're singing from his Diwan? Yeah, singing from his Diwan. So it's a different, it's a completely different experience reciting in Egypt. Um, also, like, say, Morocco, I'd go to the Zawi, I've seen the Ahmed Tijani, I've been there a few times to recite and sing, and also yeah. in Algeria, the same Zawi, the, in the Zawi, and yeah, different places. So can you give me a sample of Sidi uh, Salah Jafari? He's like my a personal favorite of mine. But can you give me well, like a couple lines from his diwan? I mean, I know his diwan, I have it, but I, I, I don't know how to sing it. I just know it as a you know, text. Inshallah, maybe his most famous um, Rodatul Qulub, so Rodat Hadi, Rodan Hadi Nabina. Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Rawdatul hadi nabina Huyat lil muttaqina Rawdatul hadi nabina 
هيئت للمتقين كل من قالوا رضينا بالحبيب مولاي محمد صلى الله وعلى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ناظم الدر المحرر صالح من آل جعفر راجي فضلا منك أكبر بالحبيب مولاي محمد صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. So you know, next time you come to Cairo. You should come to the uh, to our Hadra. Uh, and we have. Do you know? Do you know this guy? The, this group uh, called Nur and Nabi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Abu Bakr, he's he's a uh, he's a muqaddim of the tariq. Okay, inshallah. Uh, he's our main munshi. So is the where does the Hadra take place near? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think there's a Hadra. There's a Hadra in the Sheikh's Mosque in, in October 6th city. There's a Hadra, I think, in the Sidman Hussein Mosque. Uh, you know, throughout the, that's in Cairo. There are hadras in Asyut, Alexandria, I think Qalyubeya. But there's like at least three, four in uh, in Cairo. Uh, and we have our own zawiya. We have our own zawiya. But but I mean, I'm not the munshid guy. I'm just sort of like <laughs> kind of like sing along. But, but I I can I want to put you in touch with those guys uh, because you know, mashallah, maybe you can. Yeah, definitely, inshallah. Yeah, maybe you Some can record some stuff. Yeah. I I. Have, I have found that Egyptians are not the best at inshed. You know, our, our, our Egyptians forte is ilm, Quran, recitation. Uh, and I really love the inshed of the shawam. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then the Moroccans, of course. I mean, in the Arabic world. But I think that the influx of Syrian people in Egypt now is starting to impact that. And that there are a lot of munshids, you know, like Mustafa Atif, you know, everyone knows. Yeah. And I know that you know he's a good friend of yours. And mashallah. Uh, it's starting to change. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to plug you. I mean, this is so, sort of popular. Definitely. MashaAllah. So, uh, so Sidi Salah Jafari, you know, he's one of those characters who's, I think, you know, there's no end to how much you can talk about him and, you know, stories about him and what he's done. And, and his tariq is they're very strong in the UK. He's a big ja- Jafari influence. Yeah, getting stronger, alhamdulillah. Yeah, it's uh, getting stronger. There's many sort of, as you know, you've been to the UK. <laughs> I've got many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, England, Birmingham, uh, Sharif is a little bit like Cairo. You know, there's like a thousand and one total, thousand and one yeah. mosques. So that's another topic for another day. You know? but, so do you, do you do nasheeds in non-Arabic and non-English? Uh, yeah, so it depends on the language. I know one Turkish one, I know two, three, four Urdu nasheeds. So whatever language I could try and sing in, I'll, I'll sing in that. Okay, but you, 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 what are you most comfortable in? English and Arabic, is that fair? Arabic, just literally Arabic, I'm more comfortable okay. with that. Okay. <laughs> Do you think, Mikhail, have you considered like recording these like popular nasheeds? Yes, yeah, so um, it's an idea. So loads of people have told me, even my closest uh, teachers have told me to record the famous qasai, the traditional ones, and just make an album and... That's it, and leave it because people would love to listen and refer back to those nasheeds or listen to them every day. So release something for those people. Yeah. So offline, if you're interested, let me know because uh, I have a couple of uh, collections uh, that would be like an easy, uh, like slim down version of these are the popular like nasheeds. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah. All stuff that you know, and you probably can add to them. But yeah. that would be nice. You know, it'd be interesting to have that with a companion book. Definitely. Yeah. Inshallah. Uh, to teach people and you know, it'll be nice here for the younger generation as well because they start yeah, off with those school things. events. That's exactly what I was thinking. I mean, when I was growing up, all I knew was Tala al Badr Ali, yeah. which is good, I mean, it's fine, alhamdulillah. But I didn't but know the, 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 about yeah. these like Hadra and Qasai. I was like, whoa, that was a whole new world uh, to me. And it, it's nice if kids just learn like these are just normal things that we sing, you know, the holiday times. It's, that'd be nice. As I think about sort of rounding another term with you on this uh, conversation, hopefully we can 
have a real second conversation, not like, you know, <laughs> not redoing this one. Um, you know, mashallah, you started off all of this stuff like super young. And, you know, you're still relatively young, uh, even though if you don't feel like that. I mean, I'm telling you, I know you're young. So what do you, can you like project out for us like five, seven years into your future? Like what, what are you trying to accomplish with these talents that, you know, Allah, mashallah, Allah has given you? Uh, that's one thing I always uh, think about and I ask everybody for advice about this like so me myself I don't really even though I'd like to have a vision for the future about what I could do I literally don't at the moment so that's my only problem um, what I do hope inshallah is um, to have a, a bit a wider audience I'd say from different countries and inshallah travel to many different countries as well and have an audience that's not s- simply just um the same people that we uh, were to sing to in the masjid or, or in the gatherings and stuff like that, but have an audience that are not used to this style, but bring them into that style through a different um, through a different way. So like how I did Allah Ya Mawlana in that modern sort of way, where people maybe who aren't even really that religious would listen to something like that as well. So I'd want to appeal to them more in the future. In terms of myself, um, inshallah, hopefully uh, uh, graduate from university, inshallah, still deciding whether to study pharmacy or do another course and then go on to do medicine after so that's another thing or maybe go to study Egypt after that as well so there's many things in the future inshallah, inshallah. as well as my charity work so I work for a charity as well so I want to make that go and progress forward yeah. it's just a charity based in the, the UK Human Relief Foundation in Birmingham um, actually they, they started off in Iraq actually so I'm traveling out this Sunday to the Syrian border in Lebanon with them for six so tell us about that, the charity. That's, again, something I didn't know about, about you. What, what does that work entail? Uh, mainly it's fundraising, organizing um, events for fundraising events. So say before COVID, um, we've had conversations with many reciters, many scholars, just to invite them to the UK and host, host events, host events. Um, where we, inshallah, we can fundraise and spread awareness about the charity and the causes. Now with COVID, we fundraise online and we with that money, we also go abroad. So we'd go to Lebanon, we'd go to Iraq, we'd go to, there's a deployment going out to Yemen in the in the, in in Ramadan, which unfortunately I can't make, but we go there and we see the conditions of the people as well. So when we come back from these deployments, we actually have more of a passion and we have actually have, we have an actual passion to fundraise for these people because it's really easy to fundraise um, without having uh, empathy for who you're fundraising for. Mm-hmm. And it's really easy to, just miss the whole point of fundraising. But once you go there, it really motivates you to uh, come back. And uh, How long have you been involved with this charity work? Uh, I'd say about two years. Well, I've been, I've known all the charities in the UK since I was young, for, obviously from events and stuff, but about two years I've been working for mm. this charity well, since I've been back from Egypt. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah, soon we're planning to um, work in uh, Egypt as well with uh, the charities the uh, Khair Baladna and these charities. Um, so inshallah, let's see. Inshallah, inshallah. So uh, would you like to leave us with anything? Uh, a quote or a thought or a question even? I think the last thing I'd leave everybody with about um, after what, all of what we've discussed is just literally to have a good um, intention with everything. Uh, since I started the journey in 2012, 2011, I always had that intention. <laughs> the first intention was for Umrah, for the sake of Allah, inshallah. And from there, Allah opened up many, many more doors after that Umrah as well. So even going on that Umrah, if we go back to that, um, I made dua to Allah that he, because I loved Egypt so much, <laughs> that Allah allows me to go back to Egypt and live there for um, for a long time, which alhamdulillah, uh, I got to do. And um it's just to have that intention, just do everything for his sake and to benefit his um, his people. So to benefit the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this world, that's all we can do. And that's the best that each and every one of us can do. We can benefit them and Allah will uh, give us much more, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allah, that's a good reminder, uh, especially to me, because in trying to do all of this and put together all of this content, sometimes you lose... You know, you're in the in the forest and you see all these trees and you lose like the, the, the bigger image. So thank you for that reminder. I appreciate that. Uh, and, and I second that. Uh, I had that same advice very early on in my pursuit when I was studying. Uh, and uh, alhamdulillah, when I came to Egypt, just and I'll end with this, but when I came to Egypt and I was at Al-Azhar for the first time, 
and I attended a class, I realized that this was the big leagues. This is not like the Sunday school. I mean, I had like a totally different conception of my life. When I was actually there, I was like, oh, this is the real, this is the major leagues. You know, in America, we have major league you know, baseball and minor leagues. Yeah. And then I realized, I was like, okay, I, I have to have a pure intention because I've never seen the dean talked about it with this level of sophistication. And alhamdulillah, I feel because I had a, I feel it was a good intention. Allah Ta'ala opened up as like you, like you, he opened up many doors for me in that world. So I'm grateful and uh, I can't emphasize your advice enough, you know, a pure intention. It's the first hadith that's in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, So, you know, may we all have a pure intention. Mm-hmm. Miguel, thank you so much. Uh, and again, my apologies for the back and forth on the scheduling. And I'm used no, to it. Well, <laughs> so we'll talk to you soon, hopefully for a part two, maybe when you have a couple more uh, albums out. Okay. Right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum